Good morning again. So, as Ali told you, this is the 10th year of Apache Spark. Um, 10 years ago, we at UC Berkeley donated the project Spark to the Apache Software Foundation. So Spark officially became Apache Spark. In the 10th year, um, I would like to take a little bit of opportunity to review some of the project's history. Seems like the theme uh, I'm doing on this uh, keynote stage this year, anyway. So Spark started at UC Berkeley. The birth of place of not just Spark, but also BSD Unix, um, Postgres, RISC, Ray, there's a lot of foundational projects. Right, one thing that's really special about the project is that it has a culture of incorporating bleeding edge research ideas and make it real, make it into the real world workloads. And many of this led to also high profile research publication really move the field forward. Um, and this really what made the Spark project very unique in its beginning, um, but the project kept its roots. A couple years after the donation of the project, um, it has received some widespread media attention. Um, for example, IBM called Spark potentially the most significant open source project for the whole next decade. I think that to a large extent become true. Now you might ask, hey, who cares about what IBM thinks? I'm not using mainframes anymore. <laughs> um, in the same year, Fortune magazine called Spark the Taylor Swift of data. It's not the first time we showed it at the conference. I finally felt, hey, when I read that, I felt, hey, I could finally explain to my wife and my mom uh, what I do for a living. The, um, what he means is really Spark came from nowhere um, with a meteoric rise and uh, rose to prominence and ubiquity. All right. According to uh, OSS Insights, which is the open source project, uh, project that tracks all the uh, open source projects, for the, every year in the last 10 years, Spark has been the most actively developed project in big data, with over 3,600 contributors and 40,000 commits. It's remarkable for a 10-year history. <laughs> no. But perhaps the most remarkable, remarkable metrics what Ali showed you uh, yesterday, the project has been downloaded over a billion times. A billion times. Um, that's across Maven, PyPy, and also on Databricks itself. So what other reasons led to the project's ubiquity? Um, I think there are a few principles behind the project really worth uh, highlighting. The first is that the focus on simple, expressive, and modular APIs with well-defined semantics that makes the program easier to write. But also more importantly, this API is sufficiently abstracted, so they allow the backends to optimize over time without the programmers having to actually change the code they write. The second, which is often overlooked, is Spark can run virtually everywhere. You can start developing your Spark programs on your laptop without any internet connectivity. I was literally coding the last time I was on the airplane um, Spark programs running on my laptop. And you can use your CI CD tools in your own network environment, and you can publish your Spark program to the private cloud or the public cloud for execution. Um, this is very important because you don't have to depend on any third party. Everything is self-contained. You don't have to depend on any third party just to even test your program. Now, last but not least, the multi-paradigm extensibility of the project. Spark is available. There's many facets to that. Spark is available in virtually um, so all the most important popular programming languages and data and AI. Started with Scala. We added Java, R, Python, and SQL later. But there are other ways you can extend Spark. For example, data sources and federation. It's been extended to virtually all data sources. Any data source you name, you could probably find an open source implementation of that data source um, for Spark out there. And we're in the Generation AI conference here. Um, Spark is a very important part of data science and AI. The four most popular um, AI frameworks right now are probably Langchain, Hugging Face, PyTorch, and XGBoost. And all four have native Spark integrations. So despite success, the project is not sitting idle. Right? We're introducing the community is working on a massive number of improvements, literally thousands of them for every Spark release. We won't be able to go through all of them, but I want to highlight three um, today. That's my personal favorite. The first, Spark Connect, and then Python, and then a new programming language. So we'll first start with Spark Connect. Last year on this stage, Martin and I introduced Spark Connect to you. Um, it's a new way of invest Spark in your applications going beyond just SQL. This year, I'm excited to tell you that Spark Connect is GA in Spark 3.4. Now, it creates a narrow ways 
for Apache Spark computation. And this narrow ways can be leveraged to create thin clients that can be embedded into different programming languages, applications, and edge devices. So what are the use cases for Spark Connect? First, you can use Spark Connect to connect to a remote Spark deployment in the cloud, in your private data centers, or in a different laptop. You can interactively develop and debug in your IDEs, sharing the same production environment of your actual environment. It enables also developers around the world to much easily create new programming language SDKs for Spark. For example, I already know there are community members working on the Go language support. Um, any Go programmers here? The uh, Scala 3, Rust, Swift, um, and also our own Databricks Connect has been upgraded to build on Spark Connect. The second thing I want to cover is Python. As most of you know, Python is the number one programming language in the data and AI era. But beyond that, Python actually just ended C and Java's 20-year run in the TOB index. We started years ago Project Zen to make Python a first-class citizen for Spark, to really make the Spark, Py, PySpark experience Pythonic. And there's been a lot of work that gone into it. But perhaps the most evident and visual one is the uh, autocomplete. Um, in Spark 2, which is before Project Xamarin was started, if you start using uh, Python in IPython Notebook or Jupyter Notebook, IPython kernel, um, you barely see anything in autocomplete for Spark APIs. In Spark 3.1, you start seeing parameter names showing up, so it makes it already easier to use. In Spark 3.4, the latest release, you can see full signature along with the full documentation in autocomplete directly, making it much easier to write your Spark programs. Ooh, like. Now, maybe you don't need autocomplete anymore very soon, but I'll get to that. <laughs> so a lot of the focus on Project Zen in the last few years has been on uh, the end user's experience of writing Python code using Spark. Um, now the community is actually discussing how do we make that first-class citizen experience of Python also extend to uh, extending Spark itself. In the past, for a Python shop, you want to extend Spark to add your own data sources, to define a uh, user-defined table function. You have to learn Scala or Java, because that's the only way to extend it. Now the community is discussing creating Python-based data source APIs and user-defined table, table functions so Python teams can extend Spark without learning any new languages. And the community is also working on how do you properly test Spark it's a remarkably complicated process to test any data programs. It depends on not just the program's logic itself, but also the data. So we're creating a new library that introduces native asserts for data and uh, a lot of other capabilities to make it substantially easier to test your PySpark program. With all of this work, we're really making Python a first-class citizen, going all the way from the end user's experience to the experience of framework developers and more sophisticated users that can actually extend Spark itself. So the last one I was talking about is the new program language. Some of you might have guessed, but it's actually a little bit different from what you think about. Um, the, so by now, you've all heard Andre Kapasi said the, uh, um, the hottest new program language is English. My extension of it is that English is a new program language, Gen AI is a new compiler, and Python is a new bytecode. What does that mean? In the last few months, a lot of you probably have tried using ChatGB to generate Spark code. And not because you didn't know how to write Spark, but because sometimes it's difficult to figure out exactly what API to use or what signature you need. Um, the, however, ChatGPT was trained on the very large corpus of Spark code on GitHub and probably on the open internet that's full of anti-patterns and full of patterns that might be uh, old. Um, so you actually also often generate code that's not ideal. And in order to improve the code, you start using prompt engineering to tell ChatGPT, hey, please do, for example, use the data frame API. Don't use the RDD API. And a lot of you are doing that every day. So instead of you having to figure out what the right prompts are, we're excited to introduce what we call the English SDK for Spark. It's a new open source project that helps you author Spark code with prompt engineering already done by the Spark experts to minimize anti-patterns. Instead of me walking through you through it, I would like to just show you what it can do. So with that, I would like to invite Allison onto stage to show you a demo.
thank you, Reynolds. Just set up the computer here. Now, let's do a demo. For this demo, why do I do some data analysis on Spark? I want to see the community contributions over time using the GitHub pull request data. We can use the GitHub APIs to download the data. But wouldn't it be great to use Spark to read the data directly? With the latest proposal to add Python-based data source APIs, we can write a custom GitHub data source in Python and use it to load data into Spark as a data frame. Now, we have the GitHub data. Let's do some data cleaning and transformations. I want to get the seven-day moving average of the number of pull requests created by date. I know I need to use some aggregation and window functions to compute the moving average, but I don't recall the specific APIs. I should look it up. So here's window function documentations and Stack Overflow. What we can see here is that I can already express what I want to do in English. But why does it take so much time to put my thoughts into code? Can we just use plain English? Absolutely. We're able to do this using the English SDK for Apache Spark. It is super easy to get started. You can simply instantiate the Spark AI class and activate it. And all your data frames will be AI powered. Let's reload the GitHub data and do some data transformations using English. First, let's add a column called date. Let's copy paste in here. Then let's aggregate the number of pull requests by date. Yep, let's copy paste in the prompt here. And finally, we can compute the seven-day moving average. Let's copy this over. And now, let's display the results to see if it works. Great. We have the data now. Let's uh, visualize it to see what it looks like. The plot looks good. But wouldn't it be great to also overlay the historical Spark releases on this data and check for patterns? Instead of manually copy pasting the release data, I can request the data through the create DF function and filter for major and feature releases. Let's see what the data looks like. Finally, here is what I want to plot. We have the seven-day moving average, and the vertical bars indicate the Spark releases. Everyone who has ever tried to plot something like this knows how painful it can be. But now, using the English SDK, it's much easier. You can use it to plot the data with a prompt. Here, I'm simply typing out the plot we want to generate. Seven-day moving average annotated with Spark versions. Let's run the command. And the results look exactly as we wanted. Look how easy it is. Allison. The number of people that could create this chart without looking up the internet spending half an hour it's probably in the hundreds in the entire world, <laughs> right? But now all of you could do that <laughs> very easily using this uh, PySpark. And by the way, it also looks uh, pretty obvious that uh, everybody procrastinates. Um, it's no longer on the screen, but the, if you look at it, um, right before the uh, commit deadline, the version release deadline, the commit activity peaks. So Spark committers totally procrastinates. And right after, everybody takes vacation, and the, uh, the commit drops massively. So the English SDK for Apache Spark does not just help you write your basic Spark code. It actually helps you with all the stages of your data science or data engineering program, going from ingestion, transformation, verification, explanation, to uh, plotting. Right? 
go check it out at pyspark.ai for the English SDK for Apache Spark. Now, there's so much more that's happening with this Apache Spark community that I simply don't have time to talk to you all about. I will encourage you, encourage you to check out this few talks um, about it at this conference today. Now, next, I would like to invite Michael Ambras onto stage to tell you more about Delta 3.0, which is probably the most exciting release of the project since the initial introduction of the project. Michael needs no introduction. He's a distinguished engineer at Databricks, one of our earliest members of the company. He's also the original creator of Spark SQL, Structured Streaming, Delta Lake, Delta Live Tables, the list goes on. All right. Welcome to the stage, Michael. <laughs> 